Well, thank you very much. It's great to be here. Part, uh, this is uh, not a computer injury, I, my shoulder. Uh, and I'm very glad to be here because uh, the Institute is one of, has always been a very friendly toward us. Because back when we were a supplicant, I mean a candidate member of the, <laughs> of the EU, then uh, probably the, most, uh, the best understanding of our plight and of our position uh, around Europe I found here and precisely in this place, so I'm glad to be back. Uh, what I thought I'd do, I mean, my title really should be the good, the bad, and the really ugly. And so uh, I'll just talk a little about the good and why we are so involved in all this, is that basically for us, uh, when, we became when we became independent again, we basically faced, uh, you know, okay, we knew that uh, we wanted a liberal democracy and, uh, and then we want to have a market economy. But the problem was that uh, everything else was basically sort of 50 years old, including our uh, phone exchange. And, uh, <clears throat> and the question was, how are we going to get over this? How are we going to make up 50 years of unbuilt infrastructure? And uh, the, the solution a number of us came upon was that basically we're going to focus on, on uh, digital solutions we sort of uh, leapfrog uh, a whole bunch of steps and that uh, we're going to uh, not take as aid legacy, legacy uh, machinery forms, whatever, um, because we don't want to, we want to advance to the highest level as quickly as possible. And we took a fairly concerted uh, approach to uh, getting schools online, getting services online, taxation online. Uh, which all of which had the benefit of getting kids started starting uh, very early on uh, using computers, which is where you know, my own experience with that was very was important there. Uh, you know, tax compliance pay, tax payment compliance rates are much higher if you have a easy to uh, deal with computer program. It takes me about two minutes to do my taxes. I just look it over, press the button, goes off. And then uh, all kinds of other things that we have uh, online today, from e-health records to, uh, to voting, which in our case, so far, we've had three elections, two general and one local election uh, done online. Uh, our e-health services are probably among the best in the world. We have, uh, we have a digital prescription, which I understand after an investment of 35 billion was an utter failure, a billion pounds was an utter failure in the UK, but in our case, it's, uh, we, 90% uh, of prescriptions are done um, uh, online. You just do it at home, or you call your doctor and you say, I, you know, I ran out. He says, you know, makes a few keystrokes. You go to any pharmacy in the country, you put in your little ID card, they say, okay, you get, you know, whatever it is that you need. Uh, but, but that's the good side. Uh, we are a country that is highly dependent upon, uh, upon the use of computers and ultimately just the rationale for it was not only that we can get to leapfrog a whole lot of, uh, sort, of um, sort of backwardness, but the other thing is our, our fundamental neurosis with our smallness. I mean, we're 1.3 million. Uh, you know, we go, you know, what can you do in the world? How are we going to survive in the world? I mean, we're sort of, you know, sort of half the size of Copenhagen. Um, it's not, it's, it's, it's a tough challenge. And the answer came to me reading a, a neo-Luddite, neo-Marxist text by Jeremy Rifkin about uh, 15 years ago called The End of Work. And there he talks about how everyone's going to be without a job because they're all computers are going to do everything and machines are going to do everything. And the example he brought, which was so inspirational to me, was a steel plant in Kentucky which produced, I don't know, X hundred or thousand tons of steel a year and employed 12,000 people. And then it was sold to a Japanese company that automatized and computerized the whole operation. And now they're producing exactly the same amount of steel but with 120 people. And this was an example of how terrible it all was. And as an Estonian with 1.3 million people, I said, this is great. This is what we need. We need to computerize everything and liberate people from doing all those things that machines can do better and have them do creative things. And that's more or less the way things have gone. Uh, I guess we're the most uh, sort of advanced country in Europe, at least, on e-services, on or government services on the web. I mean, other areas perhaps uh, not so advanced, 
one of the advantages of the school program, of course, we uh, kids started uh, learning programming at a fairly early age, which then brought uh, brilliant results for us when a group of four kids first invented something called Kaza, which they then almost went to jail for in the US, but they escaped that and then they invented something because basically it's based on the same kind of idea, but it, was, it is called Skype. Uh, and Skype's research and development headquarters remains in Estonia even though they pay taxes to Luxembourg and they're owned by Microsoft today. But, but anyway, these young guys, disgustingly young people are all million, billionaires, but what can you do? Now, now to the nasty part, which is the bad, and then we'll get to the really ugly. The bad part is that uh, the, you know, computer crime has been going on almost since the beginning of the use of computers. I remember in 1972 reading an article about how clever programs that rounded up interest or rounded off interest would sort of give sort of, you know, ten thousandths of a penny would be deposited in some other, some other account. But if you do this for a New York bank, you end up. Uh, pretty soon amassing quite a bit of money. But things have gotten much more advanced, and, uh, and in 2007, we were subjected to uh, what are called DDoS attacks, distributed denial of services attacks, which for the uninitiated is basically huge numbers of attacks come uh, to a server, and it overloads the server, and it frizzles. Uh, or stops working. And the mechanism for doing this in all, all cases, almost, are using, uh, using a mafia criminal network of robot computers, hijack computers, that uh, are called bots, and botnets are networks of hijack computers. They are control, under the control of some group. Uh, their day job is sending out Viagrads via spam, but they can be hired for doing other things, and that is focusing uh, instead of a wide array of uh, a wide array of uh, recipients that you you know the stuff that piles up in your junk mail. They can be used also to attack a specific computer and do it sort of you know get a million pings a second, and it just can't the server can't handle it. Now, DDoS attacks, which are, do represent already a unique form of public-private partnership between, uh, or can represent if, it, if they're hired for political ends, uh, have been used for years against mainly ministries of defense. Um, you know, the Germans, the Israelis, the Americans, the Brits, the Estonians, uh, you know, the Pentagon, they've all been subject to DDoS attacks. Um, uh, they're kind of a nuisance. Uh, but they, and those clearly are a case of uh, public-private partnership because basically who really cares about uh, the, the, you know, sort of, you know, I mean, they don't care about the ministries, defense, governments do, governments organize them, and uh, that's what we have dealt with. In 2007, we were, uh, Estonia, because of a political dispute we had with the Russians regarding a statue of a Soviet soldier that was in the center of town, uh, I guess you would, the moral equivalent of it would be to have a, uh, a soldier from your eastern neighbor, a uh, statue of a soldier of your eastern neighbor in your main square, and then they wanted to keep it there. And we think, and you think you don't want it there. Well, we basically had the same problem, and so we, we moved the statue. We did not destroy it or anything. We just put it into a a less obvious place. We put it into a military cemetery. But as a result, we... <laughs> No, no, I mean, it was, uh, but we were, uh, we found as a result of this, uh, I mean, increasing number of cyber attacks, which culminated on the 9th of May, the, the day of the anniversary of the uh, end of World War II for the Soviets, for it's European day for us, and in the rest of the world, May 8th is the day, but Stalin wanted to have his own day. But anyway, May 9th, and... It, uh, the, our banks were attacked, our newspapers were attacked, all government sites were attacked. Uh, briefly, even our 112 emergency number was attacked. And the, uh, all the, the newspapers were down, the banks were down, the government sites were down. Uh, looking back on it, I mean, it was kind of this crazy period, um, and they're all kind of uh, ad hoc solutions, banks, in order to... Uh, uh, in order to keep these, I mean, to stop these attacks, basically, we're, wouldn't, we isolated the country, wouldn't take anything in from outside of the country. 
Uh, but then again, all the people, since so much of our banking, 95% is done online, that means any, any, any kind of transfers from abroad or to abroad were then were shut down. I mean, it clearly had major economic effects. Um, when we looked at, at it after the attacks, after the fact, we uh, went to our CERT, the Computer Emergency Response uh, Team, that every EU member has a, one of these CERT things uh, where you, the smart guys with ponytails look at what's going on for the, in the infrastructure. And, and uh, I was showing a graph of this, and I was expecting sort of a, you know, the normal Gaussian curve, sort of, sort of rising up and then fading away and all centered around this time. When in fact the, the graph uh, they showed, uh, showed me was, was completely discrete. It's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, GMT, the attack started, and then it just was a hugely high level, lasted exactly 24 hours, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 GMT, the next day it stopped. And I said, well, this is not, this is not normal. I mean, <laughs> this, is, this is not to be expected. Um, and uh, they said, yeah, right, well, that's the way it was. And I said, well, how was that? And he said, well, the money ran out. And I said, we need the money ran out. Said, well, so, I mean, this is, these, these things are hired. They're rented. Uh, they, the attack lasts for a certain number of hours. And then it stops. I mean, this is all for rent. That, and that's where I realized there was this thing, this sort of unique public-private partnership going on. Um, and it has nothing to do, I mean, it, certainly that disposes of the whole argument that these kinds of things are you know, this is an enraged civil society protesting against the movement of a statue. I mean, this is done for money. Uh, the next step in this kind of stuff, uh, which, which, may, which sort of gets a little more, sort of, um, well, creates a little more nervousness, is the, that a year later in the uh, Georgian War, um, what the military calls these days kinetic attacks, that is anything that flies, that hits you, be it a bullet, a rocket, a missile, uh, uh, in, in areas that were being attacked by the Russians. About half an hour, 20 minutes, sometimes an hour beforehand, they, would, they were coordinated cyber attacks against that area. Uh, which uh, is, a, you know, if you think of uh, Colin Powell's sort of new integrated approach of warfare from the first Gulf War, which is basically you combine the, the air attacks together carefully in precision manner with, with the tank attacks, that uh, they, uh, this was moved one step beyond. Uh, if you, I mean, I won't m talk more about it, except that the, if you uh, Google something called the Small Wars Journal, there actually is something called the Small Wars <laughs> Journal, and the January 2011 issue has an article by uh, a senior officer in the U.S. Cyber Command about how they found that you know these these uh, cyber attacks were taking place against sites that just to basically blank out an area so to make it sort of blind, and um, that was uh, we see that this is serious. Now, if we move beyond that, um, the next level where we all get very nervous is that um, is there is something we've all probably read about, the Stuxnet attack uh, on, the, uh, on the Bush Air uh, Uranium Enrichment Plant. Now, what Stuxnet did was it attacked something called a SCADA uh, system, which is a su supervisory command and data acquisition program, but we'll keep it at SCADA. And uh, the SCADA system is basically internet-based system that uh, controls something. Uh, and this is the something, in this case, so basically it's a kind of a feedback loop. The centrifuge starts going too fast, something monitors it, and it's, it's just constantly monitored, and something says, okay, slow down, it slows down. Then if it slows down too much, then sort of the information, data comes back, says speed up. Anyway, everything is run on these things these days. But this was a specific program designed to drive this system crazy. Um, and it worked. The problem we face today, our SCADA systems are in everything. Um, your supermarkets, basically I'd say that any modern European supermarket's food supply is based on a SCADA system. You know, how much milk, how much, how many pea, cans of peas, whatever, it's, no, it's not the guy in the little sort of goes around with his clipboard saying, okay, we need more peas. I mean, it's all done automatically. It's just it's all on the internet. It's there, that's how it works. I mean, you don't see it yourself, but it is done on the internet. Um, and SCADA systems uh, are highly vulnerable to, the, to these kinds of attacks. One of the problems with the Stuxnet uh, approach is that while it was specifically designed for the, 
or the bush hair uh, centrifuge is that basically you can, if you sort of know, you can read code, you can basically take out the, the, the centrifuge specifics and you can apply it to anything. You know, power plants, you can apply it to, you can apply it to uh, you know, cars. I mean, you can, uh, there have been experiments in which using the Bluetooth connection to a car radio, you can shut down a car's brakes. Um, you know, uh, how much toner you have in your, in your photocopier is also on a SCADA system, and, and, you, and it gets, you get sent the toner when it's sort of th on the internet, the signal says it's down to this level. Except if you control the SCADA system, you can do something very clever, such as basically send copies of everything it photocopies to another number or someplace else. I mean, you can do anything with these systems, unfortunately, if you put enough brains to it. And that's where everyone is getting really worried because there are huge vulnerabilities. Both in Estonia, about a month ago, we did a, uh, the government, the cabinet had a gaming session and they shut down our electrical system. Uh, President Obama did the same two weeks ago because, again, people don't worry about, uh, or we didn't believe it, and basically did a gaming session and they shut down an electrical power plant in New York in, I mean, in virtual reality. But it's, you know, if you, if you, if, if you can achieve the, com the shutdown commands through computers, then it's just basically as good as a real shutdown command. Now, while this is... Um, while these are the kind of more military kinds of problems that we worry about, I would say there's our own experience show that the real problem, perhaps, or the most threatening problem uh, to countries, especially if they think that they have no enemies, is actually to our economies. And our, my experience was basically last year uh, at the Munich Security Con uh, <clears throat> Conference, which is, I have a little more time, uh, Munich Security Conference, which is held uh, every year in March uh, in Munich, it used to be called Verkunde. It's where all the security policy people come together and talk about all kinds of nasty things. Last year was the first time everyone ever approached the topic of cybersecurity. Uh, and, um, and why it was so strange for me was that suddenly, I mean, that it was in particular the speeches from the UK, because in all of our attempts to get countries to sort of work on the issue of cybersecurity, the UK had always been the most standoffish, always blew us off whenever we said, look, we, you know, we need to do something here. And suddenly, David Cameron comes and gives a speech, three quarters of which is devoted to cybersecurity. William Hay comes and he gives his entire speech is devoted to cybersecurity, announces there's a huge cybersecurity uh, conference taking place, which took, uh, took place last December. And then I went to, uh, uh, to Dame Pauline Neville Jones, who I just happened to know in the security policy field for years and years. So, so what did you got? <laughs> what's happened? I mean, why have you changed? You have basically been telling us all these years that no, 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 this is not worth talking about. And suddenly you, you've done a complete change in policy. And she said, we realize how much money we're losing. And that the real, uh, our countries, I mean, UK, but basically, uh, wealth these days real, uh, is basically on our, uh, is, based on our uh, intellectual property, not, uh, not movies and acto, but I mean product development, drugs, computer programs, whatever. It's all done, it's all, on, it's all on computers, and it's being stolen. Uh, and it's not only the UK problem. Last, last week, uh, a man named Sean Henry, but judging by his first name, he probably has some Irish roots, uh, is, the, what, uh, is until, well, until was for a little time longer, the head of uh, cybersecurity at the FBI. And he, was, he testified before the U.S. Congress, and so basically he said there's a company, he didn't name which one, that had lost in one night, stolen, uh, 10 years worth of research done by a U.S. company amounting to a billion dollars of investment, and it just was like, and we can imagine where it went. Uh, and they got it for free. I mean, <laughs> they have it. And uh, I mean, it was, a, it was a very depressing testimony you can read about in last week's Wall Street Journal and today's New York Times has kind of even sort of a sexy summary of it by Richard Clark, who has written one of the best books on cybersecurity in general. I highly recommend it um, before it goes out of date. Uh, 
<laughs> I mean, all things do go out of date in this field very quickly. In any case, the problem is that it is for any country that, that whose wealth and wealth creation is based on intellectual work, not on natural resource extraction, um, has to pay attention to these issues uh, because you're going to lose it. And you know, if they're attacking Estonian companies, they're going to be, and they're attacked, so it's not just you know, the big ones. And, if, and in Ireland, with its sort of such a major uh, emphasis on, on IT, on intellectual property work, so much of your wealth creation comes from precisely the kind of stuff that, that depends on your independent uh, in research, your investment into, into new products. Uh, you're being attacked. I mean, I don't know. No one's tell. No, no one will. <laughs> no one will tell me you're being attacked. But basically, if you if you're doing anything worthwhile, you're being attacked. Um, and so, uh, think about it. Now, where how do we go? Where do we go from here? I mean, there are a couple of solutions and a couple of problem areas. The the this, the problem is that uh, IT or all, uh, this whole area of cyber. Um, is not, uh, even though we talk about cyber war, cyber defense, unfortunately this topic is, is less akin to having sort of, you know, joint forces, peacekeeping forces. It's not, it's not countries come together and say, okay, you know, we'll give you 50 men and, you know, we'll give you three tanks or whatever and we're gonna go to Lebanon or Somalia or Afghanistan, whatever. Uh, it's much more like espionage or the whole intelligence field where no one talks to anybody because everyone sort of, and um, while we understand that this, this, I mean, that is the mindset of cyber, but the, the, uh, the approach, unfortunately, has to be international. Because basically, you'd be a real idiot to attack your own country from inside your country. I mean, if you want to get at something, you're going to do it from somewhere else, especially given the sort of the, the sad state of legal affairs regarding cyber crime, cyber war, and so forth. So without cooperation, we're not going to go anywhere. Limit attempts to cooperation exist in terms of the, uh, the Council of Europe uh, Treaty or Convention on Cybercrime, which uh, is actually pretty good, uh, it, and it's not only the Council of Europe, it's been acceded to by the United States, by Canada, the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, I mean, other countries involved in intellectual property. But of course, two countries in the European, in, in, the, in the Council of Europe, Russia and Belarus refuse to sign on to it, and of course, China does not sign on either. So, I mean, not much good when the biggest problem causers are not there. At the European Union level, we have been uh, facing for years the, the traditional stovepiping problem. We have basically four different directorates dealing with cybersecurity, cyber cooperation. And so, you know, each one has their thing. They don't really talk to each other. Of course, this happens in governments too. In my country, we have, you know, the, the economics ministry has one thing they're doing relating to cybersecurity. The Ministry, uh, Ministry of the Interior has their silo, and then we have the Ministry of Defense with its silo. Uh, and so even there, trying to get cooperation inside of a government uh, is hard uh, because everyone has their own turf. Now when we look at the EU, it's even harder. Cecilia Malmström was in Estonia last week opening the, uh, the uh, Schengen data system agency. Uh, and she promised that she would be coming up with something by the end of the year to try to try to bring these different agencies in the EU together. There's one more thing where I would just throw out, and uh, which, I mean, when going back to 2007, uh, one of the things we're so we sort of smile about is that the cyber attacks uh, really were an own goal for the people who did it because we had been complaining or say, we've been urging NATO for years to say, you know, we need, we need to deal with this issue. Uh, again, they kind of blew us off all the time. Then we then came April, May 2007. They said, oh, we have this great idea. Why don't we have a cyber center in Estonia? Cyber center in Estonia, which basically deals with the more theoretical aspects of it, its official name is the Cyber Center of Excellence and it's, uh, under, it's under NATO, under NATO aegis, is however open to all and sundry. So, uh, neutrals, Switzerland, uh, who else is there? I mean, Sweden, Finland, obviously. Austria is sending a full-time person there. Korea. So anyway, you guys are interested. 
desk talk to us. It's, uh, I mean, it carries the name NATO, and I realize that sort of politically that's a different, has a, there's a different uh, resonance in, uh, in Ireland than it does in Estonia. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is, I mean, it's, it, you can think of it as a sort of PFP terms, and we'd be glad to have someone if you're interested, and the ambassador can, uh, where the ambassador went. There's the former ambassador, hi. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, that's one area. There you are, yes. I mean, that's one thing we can do. Um, we need to address these issues far more than we have. Uh, you know, the, in the last couple of years, cyber has, I mean, the whole, we've been bogged down with ACTA and, and, uh, and that, those problems in terms of um, intellectual property being illegally downloaded, and it's mainly sort of Hollywood intellectual property, but let's not get carried away and let's keep our eyes focused on the real issues. I could talk about this for basically four hours nonstop, uh, so I won't talk about it anymore. I've, I've spoken for, for uh, yeah, a half hour and that's enough, but uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here.